Welcome to the Art Lecture Series, week six. Um, today, we are lucky to have Lauren Alyssa Beerley coming to us from New York. And um, next week, we will be the final speaker for this quarter, and that will be Karina Aguilera uh, Skversky. So she's coming um, week eight and to talk about her practice. So we have two great talks to look forward to. Uh, I wanna remind you all to uh, par be participants in this and we, we are live with our speakers intentionally so that we can interact with them um, and share our ideas and ask questions and uh, further the conversation. So after at about um, 1230, we will open it up for Q and A and there are two ways of asking your questions and um, talking with Lauren. One is through the Q&A chat, and the other is to raise your hand, and we would love to hear your voice and actually have a live interaction. So please don't be shy and ask questions. And I want to um, bring on Zoe Knox to introduce Lauren. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Artist Lecture Series. Um, my name is Zoe Knox, and I'm a student in the program Ampersand, Hybridity in Visual and Narrative Art. I am honored to introduce Lauren Alyssa Beerley as this week's Artist Lecture Series guest speaker. Lauren is an interdisciplinary artist, researcher, and exhibition manager whose work is rooted in phenomenology and inspired by language, architecture, and ecology. She has synesthesia which has led her to explore, as she says, the intersection of sensory languages in our environments and how these sensory vocabularies shape our subjective experience of identity and connection to place. Beerley has two large ongoing projects that encapsulate her practice well, color translations and architecture of memory. Color Translations is a series in which she gives the viewer a peek into her experience of the world as a synesthete, uh, translating text into colorful geometric arrays. Architecture of Memory, in her own words, explores the languages within an environment and how they affect our behaviors through individual different perceptions. She achieves this by observing and documenting the environment she finds herself in through photo, video, and writing. Beerley earned a Bachelor of Architecture and minor in Art History from Pennsylvania State University in 2009, and a Master in Art in Modern Art, Connoisseurship, and History of the Art Market from Christie's Ed Education in 2010. She has over a decade of exhibition management experience under her belt, working with institutions and organizations, including the Brooklyn Museum, the Costume Institute at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts. She's been an artist in residence at Playa, Art and Science, Shaw North, and Starry Night, just to name a few. And her work has been exhibited in New York, Oregon, Kolkata, and Moscow. And with that, I'm excited to get our conversation underway. Thank you, Lauren, for being here today to share with us. Cool, perfect, so we'll get started. <laughs> okay, I'll share my screen. Thanks for having me here today. I'm really excited to present um, uh, an overview of my work from, um, you know, kind of start to finish really and what I'm doing today. Um, my name is Lauren uh, Alyssa Beerley and I'm an interdisciplinary artist and observer of the human condition is how I'm currently thinking of it. Um, Zoe gave a fantastic kind of overview as to, um, you know, the type of work you're going to see today and just how I'm going to present to you all. Um, I'm also an arts administrator, which I'm really glad she mentioned too, because that'll play into this a little bit as well. I'm originally from the Philadelphia area um, and currently living in Brooklyn where I've been for the last um, uh, 12 years. So I have a um, undergraduate degree in architecture, which has really influenced a lot of the work that I do today. And then also a grad degree in modern contemporary art history. Um, my architectural thesis here, as you see, uh, was, um, a huge intersection between art and architecture, where I looked a lot at the art history of the space in New Hope, Pennsylvania, uh, which had a great history of Pennsylvania Impressionism there, and then developed an architecture that was based around the senses. Um, 
to, uh, uh, to kind of give people an experience of this space. As Zoe mentioned, I'm a synesthete. A um, little bit of background on synesthesia. Synesthesia is when one uh, modality, sensory modality, is triggered to um, or triggers another sensory modality. I have various forms of this. I've been a University of Sussex uh, test subject for the, since 2013, I think. And um, I have various forms of synesthesia. Um, this top left one here is uh, graph and color synesthesia, which means I read all letters and numbers as color. I also have ordinal personification linguistic synesthesia, which means that I see, or I all, all letters for me have relationships with each other, kind of like brothers and sisters or personalities. I also have a spatial sequence version of synesthesia, which is time space. And then um, most recently I found out that I have a pain auditory tactile synesthesia as well. So I'll touch on a couple of those here today in my presentation. Um, so I started my art practice and you know, people often wonder, you know, you have a background in architecture and uh, art history. When did you start your art practice? Uh, I started back in uh, 2013 was the first time I made my first work. Um, and well, like first official work. <laughs> and part of that came out of working with a, a program called the Shift Residency at the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts. Um, the artists were also arts administrators who work in museums and schools and um, kind of like the arts nonprofit scene uh, to help further other artists uh, uh, kind of careers too. Um, and so a big part of their dual identities as both artists and administrators was inspiring for me, um, spending a lot of time with them during their, their studio intensives, discussing um, you know, their practices and the, the ideas that they were working through was, was something that helped me kind of put that first um, brush to paper. And then also um, their follow-up meetings of just basically a support group for these people to make sure that they continue being creative. So my practice is, as Zoe mentioned um, really nicely, is rooted in phenomenology and it's informed by ecology, language, and architecture. Um, and so what that means is phenomenology, um, I believe, is the root of the uh, human condition. Um, it, has a lot to do with how we form our identities and then also um, how we express ourselves in our subjective natures. So um, my process as a result of kind of like working with this phenomenology is um, it's really process-based, which means that my practice is forever evolving. So what I've done is I've created these two kind of um, branches of my practice, uh, color translations, which is a exploration of my subjective conditions. Um, and then architecture of memory, which is an exploration of the non kind of human subjective condition. Okay, so we're gonna start with the mind. <laughs> so color translations, um, it started with a uh, focus on graphene color synesthesia. In these discussions with the shift residents over the years, I had decided and kind of like talking to them about synesthesia and these other conditions, what I wanted to do was kind of form for them my internal experience and um, express that outward. Um, so it all started as curiosity in 2013. And um, I decided to first translate Ralph Waldo Emerson's essay, Nature, into color. Um, this kind of came a little bit later. These were completed in 2015. But the first uh, time I translated Nature um, was a, a different form from this one. Um, and Emerson had first come to me in high school in the form of like a torn piece of paper that was slipped through my, um, my locker at the time. And uh, the quote on it said, insist on yourself, never imitate. It didn't have his name associated with it. So I had taken it down hall to the library and decided um, to see if I could find who the author was. And sure enough, it was Emerson. Um, and it's from his essay, Self-Reliance, which will you know, come into play a little bit later. Um, I wanted to learn more about his kind of ideals, his values in the transcendental movement once the quote came up again years later, once I had moved to New York. And so this series you see right here grew out of it. Um, so I've translated more than 10 uh, essays of Emerson to date at this point. Um, and the color palette for each one of them is derived from the title of each essay. So I use the essay of, um, uh, each Emerson essay as like a blueprint for the overall piece. Um, and I'll explain that later in, when I talk about process. Each of the objects that you're gonna see, I'll show you three different ones, has a different color palette. 
um, which is based on the title. So this one is titled Spiritual Laws, which means there's 13 letters in the, the phrase Spiritual Laws, which means there's 13 layers of color. And this one here is Character. Um, there's nine letters in character and there's nine layers of color. Uh, I was really interested in working with uh, the 1929 edition of the, of the essay because it has these wonderful kind of block quotes. And so that's where each one of these squares comes in and I'll show you those in more detail in a little bit. Um, I like these squares just because they break the monotony of what I'm of like a kind of, um, of a movement color field that I'm trying to produce and um, give it enough of a depth too that makes the time and movement kind of conversation also come into play. And then here's education, which is, um, I believe this one's nine letters as well, which means it's also nine layers of color. And the size and the composition of each one is dependent on the format of the essay, which I'll go into next. So as you saw in those previous images of each artwork, there were those squares. So this is what I'm talking about. Each one of the essays of the 1929 edition, which is the first edition of, the, of his writings, um, all have this wonderful block quote that is you know, on every so many pages. And so um, what I do is I'll lay one piece of material over the essay, dot in that one letter in one color, um, pull that away and then put another one. So in this case, you're seeing on the image on the right there, it's all the letter A that has been dotted in yellow because that's the association I have with it in, in um, my synesthesia. So here is a, um, the, uh, the blueprint. The essay is gridded out over this much space and then um, the material is laid one by one. These are color samples that I do. Um, this, was, this piece was done for a client in Connecticut. And so since he, you know, we couldn't do a studio visit directly, I had um, mailed him some color samples. So the image on the left shows you all the A's that are dotted over top of one layer of plexi. Image on the right is the letter R that's dotted throughout that entire essay. And it's the same essay every single time. This is to show you the frequency of I that's dotted on the left and then um, can barely see it, but that's the letter L that's on the right. And then the lower frequency of C that's on the left and the high frequency of E that's on the, on the right in green. Show you a process video. And so this is just to show you kind of the, the frequency of all of the, um, the different letters. So that's C that's being put on. This is E. <laughs> e takes a really long time, um, just like I and A. And then this is N. This is to show you the final piece. Um, and the, uh, the hardware for this particular construction was actually different from the hardware you had seen earlier on. This is more, um, uh, this was custom made uh, for these for this particular piece and then also the backboards too. So it's cleated to the wall instead. Um, the other ones had been installed directly into the wall. Uh, the, um, the color palette that you see on the left hand side there is the word self. So the first layer is S, the next layer is E, the next layer L and the final layer F. And then same um, kind of orientation and method on the right there. And that's the word reliance um, for the title of the essay. And so uh, I did another series um, also in the color translation form that was based off of Richard Saitowicz's writing. Uh, Richard Saitowicz is a neurologist and uh, one of the leading experts in the study of synesthesia. Um, I went through a period of time where I was really interested in reading all neurology related texts um, that were you know, digestible enough. Um, and a lot of the people I was reading were like Oliver Sacks, Richard Saitowicz who's here, um, David Eagleton, Ramachandran, uh, Van Campen and John and John Gage, um, who were all interested over the years from the 1980s to about today about the um, the topic of synesthesia at different capacities, and um, so I was interested in looking to translate a an essay that was uh, more related to the condition itself, um, and then also was kind of looking for these shorter essays and something that would give me a little more freedom in terms of the forms that I was working with. So this is a process drawing for one of the Saitwick uh, pieces that I had done. Um, 
this is going to sound kind of funny, but uh, I was really excited to work with Saito's writings because a lot of his essays were in odd numbered pages. So I could move a little bit away from that grid because a lot of the, the um, essays I had chosen for Emerson were working with even numbered pages. Um, so what I've done here is I went through each essay. And so the title of this one is Metaphor. And I've identified and circled all of the areas in the essay where the word metaphor shows up and then connected the individual letters of that word um, into these different shapes as you see them. So like this will be one shape, this little one is one shape um, and so on and so forth. And then that kind of builds the layers and the shape of the overall piece. So on the left, you're seeing the hand done process first and then on the right, that's translated into a digital file for laser cutting. And then this is the final piece. Um, the uh, Saitoic was my first kind of use with plexiglass because I wanted something that was a little more rigid. Also, I wanted to start to reflect a little bit better the viewer within the object itself. And um, that was something that Plexi gave me the ability to do. It also played with light really nicely. You like you can see in some of these pieces, I don't know if my cursor shows up, but the edge of some of these spaces too, you can get the color of, of the color that's been dotted on top. And then here's an example of another one I did. Um, this is titled Emotion. So that's connecting all the words emotion within that essay. And this is the color palette for that piece. And so as I've been doing color translations and I have been working a lot within this plexi kind of plexi and acrylic um, you know, method, I've also been trying to see how to make the experience more um, physical, uh, kind of bring yourself out of the mind because it is such a cerebral kind of um, project. And I've been working in different methods and different materials to start to do that. Um, so in 2019, I had done a uh, what I call memory recall um, walk, where I walked from uh, Pier 1 in Brooklyn Bridge Park all the way to Pier 5, which if some of you are based in New York, you know how long that walk is. <laughs> Um, and then after the fact, kind of looking at the, you know, people watching, uh, looking at what's going on on the river and what's happening in the different landscapes that are now there in that park, um, writing in memory recall, what was my experience and what exactly happened um, as, as just like a data journal almost. And so then I laid that out um, to be the size of these, these windows here and I color, translate, color translated that um, using the word coast. Um, and uh, my color associations with that word. And then I had that printed on vinyl. Um, and so what was supposed to happen <laughs> didn't necessarily happen, um, you know, as happens with experiments. Um, when this was vinyled onto the window because of the UV film that was already present on the window and then the, um, the, the fogginess of the, uh, the vinyl itself, only certain colors were able to show through and shine on the floor and kind of move over the course of the day. So it, what, it didn't actually um, represent all the colors, but it was nice to be able to see kind of like this movement in the actual space itself. And here's another piece that I have um, was recently worked on for a um, group exhibition called Gowanus Night Herons Exhibition Case Study. Um, all, the invited, all the artists who were invited in the group were given an empty box and we had to fill it in some way. And so um, I had just finished reading an essay in New Scientist about um, consciousness and kind of the, the level of consciousness that we have gone through pre-pandemic and, um, and during pandemic and was thinking a lot about just this word and how we fill space being so much in our mind. Um, so this has been color translated, a color translation of the word consciousness. Uh, so this top part, the blue block there is C, the black block next to it is O, the orange block next to that is N, and then it wraps around um, with the other letters along the, the box. And I really liked using this material because it was beginning to give me um, that uh, ability for a light source to interact with this piece. Um, and so which basically changes the personality of the object uh, over the course of like the day or where it's sitting um, and just its different locations. And then another direction I've been thinking about going is to into a more sculptural form. Um, I'll show you a project that has got me in my in my head quite a bit lately, thinking about um, just different words. 
And uh, this is a concept sketch for an inner thought piece. Um, so these would be like masks that uh, I'll either, you know, plaster off of my face or mold from my face or another way. And then they're lined on the inside with like a memory recall, whether it's a journal entry, a data or a, um, a memory recall of sorts. And then it is like a, a pin cushion that has these pins with color um, associated to each letter on the end of it, um, the pin cushion uh, effect where they would be inserted that way and kind of stick out of the back of this. So almost like you can, you know, it becomes inner thought. <laughs> um, so I wanna shift gears a little bit and talk to you about a project I had done with a collective called Incredible Witness. Um, and Incredible Witness is a, um, well, I guess the first thing I should say is that um, I had gotten to a point where working so individually and subjectively on the, the color translations element of everything, I had wanted to see how synesthesia could kind of manifest itself into the world in a, in a, um, in a larger way and involve others. And so I had, um, I had heard about Incredible Witness and was really interested in, in working working with the team. Um, so Incredible Witness is a public laboratory that asks how can people ever be quote unquote credible witnesses when even the most basic perceptions such as color vision or spatial awareness differ drastically from person to person. We invite you into unusual perceptual worlds to bring home viscerally how different each person's experience of the world can be. And so this was a collaboration between Allison Parrish um, Clarinda Macklow and myself. And uh, Clarinda had seen one of my um, Emerson pieces in an exhibition and we got talking synesthesia and she was like, oh my gosh, she would be amazing for this project that I'm putting together. Um, and so Clarinda Macklow, she started out working in dance and molecular biology in the late 1980s and now works in performance and installation. Um, she's a co-founder and executive director of Cultural Push and an experimental organization, or it is an experimental organization that links artistic practice and civil engagement. Um, she's also co-curator of a project called Works on Water, which is a triennial that supports art that works on, in, or with water and waterways. Um, and then Allison Parrish is a computer programmer, a poet, and a game designer whose teaching and practice address the unusual phenomena that blossom from language and computers, or when language and computers meet. She's an assistant arts professor at NYU's interactive te telecommunications program. And so what we did with this uh, project, we had four experiments. Um, we started off by each individually uh, developing a, a game of sorts. And then we came together and tested that game on each other, the three of us. And then we opened it up to experiments. So our first experiments was working with, with our friends. We had three different types of games. Um, uh, Clarinda's was a game that was based around her really awful uh, sense of direction. And then mine was based on um, kind of like a, a combination of grapheme color synesthesia and then also this ordinal linguistic personification synesthesia, which is the one where numbers have personalities. Um, and then uh, Allison had worked with the two of us to develop com computer programs that would kind of like simulate these different things. So here you're seeing um, on the left, our first experiment of Incredible Witness with a group where they were um, given these directions and then kind of moved through space. Um, and then on the right is also, is our experiment number four um, for a conference at NYU. So my game, what we had was, it was based off of um, the game's categories, if anyone's familiar. Um, so using the rules of that game to uh, be the groundwork for, for this project. Um, so we had like four different types of cards that everyone was going through, as you see here, colors, number, shape, and letter. Um, and then there were four rounds. The first round, round was um, taste. The second round was character qualities. The third round was smell. And the fourth round was sound. So you would be in the first round and the taste round, someone would flip a color or flip a shape and you had to an associate a shape with a taste. So the project was, um, it was really fun and successful. Experiments two, three, and four, we had um, invited kind of strangers and the general public into, and um, we had some people who made really good friends and kept in touch after the fact. So these are um, 
uh, kind of outtake surveys that everyone had taken. So when they came in, they gave they um, they came in and gave us a little account as to what they were expecting to happen before they played any of the games or participated in any way. Um, and then when they left, they also filled out a survey that was like what you learned basically. So about the um, the game that I had worked on specifically, I really like this one on the on the left. Uh, yes, very much so. I felt like I bonded and empathized with my fellow players. I felt creatively energized and awake while associating disparate things, which is something you don't often <laughs> hear people say, but was really excited to get that kind of a review. Um, and there was another moment, and I think it was actually with this group who's pictured here on the left, where there was a woman there who was visiting her sister and she didn't speak English very well. And it was a sound round <laughs> and someone had flipped, uh, I think it was a shape of sorts. And she, and then a, a woman who was a complete stranger to her at the table, both came up with the same answer, um, which was one way to, to show that empathy can travel through um, sensory means. And there's, so there's another project um, I've been working on also through this sense of, um, of looking internally in this objective. And, Artist and uh, writer and curator, Carol Steen. Um, I had reached out to her back in the day because she is a fellow synesthete and she runs the um, American Synesthesia Association for Artists. And so I reached out to her because she's you know, much older and wanted her to be a mentor. <laughs> and, um, and we did a studio visit and one studio visit turned into a couple more studio visits. And over time, one of the last times I had seen Carol, um, she was working on this project about hypnagogic visions, which is basically like a state of um, consciousness either before to after sleep, or um, it's kind of like an in-between um, understanding of when you close your eyes, you sometimes see these forms. So she had started recording the forms that she was seeing and uh, we talked about it and I was like, oh yeah, I think I see those too. <laughs> So she had asked me to do the same thing. So the two that you see here are Carol's. And then um, this was when I started making mine as well. And she was working digitally. So she had encouraged me to work digitally too. Um, you know, so that we could kind of like compare and, and, and talk about our different experiences. And so this is a recurring form for me that I see you know, time and time again. Um, it's also the first time that I started showing my mind space is black. So all, um, all of my forms and the letters I experience as like auras over colors or auras over, <laughs> the colors I experience as auras over letters uh, also appear to me on a, on a black backdrop too. This is another experience um, of a recurring form, hypnagogic form of mine. And then this year, what I've started doing, uh, since I was, had been working in digitally for the last two years, I wanted to start kind of being a little more tactile with, with this type of thing. So after meditations, I do these quick paint and um, paint pen and pencil sketches um, of, of the, the color experience during meditation. Here's another example of one that's in progress. Okay, so MindSpace. Um, MindSpace is a fun project. It came, <laughs> it's, a, it's an intense project. It came from a, uh, oh, next slide came from a conversation with some really, really lovely people. Um, and I had been on residency in Oregon at Playa Art and Science and met another eight fellow artists, writers, and creatives who um, really inspired me. And um, so this co cohort during a studio visit I was giving them, I had asked them, what color is your mind space? <laughs> and didn't really think much of the question because I think about it so often. And some of them looked at me like I was crazy. Um, and so I just thought, nope, totally normal. Close your eyes and tell me what color you see. And so after that experience, I decided, why don't I pull the social media world? Um, so I did on Instagram and I got back a ton of really fantastic um, uh, responses to the question, what color is your mind space? Um, my favorites are a dark charcoal gray, not quite black a bright light like staring into the light at the dentist, um, glowing light columns, usually blue and green, many colors, it's overwhelming, I can relate to that, uh, warmish pale blue like Versailles, and then just simply purple. <laughs> 
So I've started producing these digital drawings um, and what they are is a, uh, the color bars that you see in the center there are the color translation of the word that I have down here. So each one of these spells in color language. But what I've done is I've given you my experience of the color on black and then two possibly different experiences um, or perspectives of the same thing. What I find interesting about this project is that um, even just placing the same exact colors onto different backgrounds goes to show you how different that experience can change. Um, and each of these colors look like they take on different personalities just from that, that very simple shift. The project also gave me a chance to focus on individual words as concepts um, and also as images and then uh, looking at their definitions too. So what I started doing was combining words um, looking at the, like defining them and what they mean in the dictionary, but also defining them for myself at that exact moment in time. Um, so more writing was attached to this, uh, which I have on an Instagram page that I can um, point you all to at the end. Um, and so each one of these would be, you know, these three um, images, but then the word would have a longer kind of like journal entry that went along with it. And then I started to get into color translations of other of words translated into other languages. Um, and the interesting thing here is this is the word blue that has been translated five different times from English, um, but all of them all share the letter U, which is that pink bar there. And then something else I decided to start integrating into this, I had talked about a spatial sequence synesthesia which for me means that time exists in my space and kind of at different heights around me. Um, so September is always the tallest or largest, almost like I'm standing on the, top, the tallest block. October, I kind of take a step down. November, I take another step down. And then December, yet another step down, and then it really drops in January and then slowly increases through the spring until it gets to the summer. And um, it wasn't until I was, <laughs> quite frankly, putting together this presentation, I always just thought, oh, it's because it's, you know, some of this is based around my birthday. But I've um, come to realize that it's actually based on the uh, daylight savings and the, um, just the daylight of the Northeast, North American kind of um, location is what my association is with. So these project, this project, it takes on kind of two different display methods. It can be, you know, all black, which is basically my perspective um, of all of these, these words translated onto a black background. Um, or it can be these, uh, you know, the gradient as you had seen too, which is, you know, this is displayed in a, in a show here in Brooklyn. And um, these are all made from a glossy aluminum print. Um, and the nice thing about these is that they then become kind of like a portrait or a mirror uh, so that the person who's looking in it is kind of, you know, also featured as part of the artwork. Okay, so <laughs> color translations um, is a big part of listening as self or listening to self, whereas architecture of memory is um, an even bigger part of listening to the non-self by activating um, like the, uh, the sensory body. So architecture of memory, it was actually prompted by uh, my experience in architecture school. Um, there was an emphasis, I had gone to uh, Penn State and the, uh, the program while well, fantastic and you know, taught me all the things, um, there was an emphasis placed a lot more on the technicalities and the engineering side, because it's, it's you know, more of an engineering school. Um, and less on the, the feeling of a space, the atmosphere, and kind of like the observation of sight. So it was something I really missed in school was observing um, just details, changing conditions, colors, form, sound, all those different things um, I missed in, in school. And so having you know come out of school, it was something that I really wanted to, to explore more. Um, through residencies and travel, I've been able to connect with places more on a sensory level, um, and especially the, the residencies that are a longer period of time. Uh, and it's, it's, it's 
started out primarily as a documentation project that was linking individual words, again, kind of looking at words and their definitions and linking those into um, the feeling of a frozen moment. So, um, you know, a, a photograph is, is, provides a memory of a place, but then using that memory only and not being in the space itself, applying a meaning to it with just one word. So that's what you see there, like this top, Top left is called convergence. The one next to it is hover. This one is nestled. The yellow one here, top row is angle. Um, and then the one on the right is divide. And then bottom row, this bottom one is plate. The second one with the, with the trains is conjoined. That center image of the tree is mirror. Um, and then this one of the window is vintage and the blue one on the bottom right is blue. So we start with New Mexico. Okay, so New Mexico was um, the first site that I had. I had a residency at Starry Night and it was a week long. Um, it was based, Starry Night is based in the town of Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. Um, and I went in July of 2017. Um, and everyone I met when I was there was like, why are you here in July? It's ridic ridiculously warm. So um, it was really nice because I had, I basically had all the spaces to myself is how it felt, uh, which I think it's pretty a sleepy town to begin with, but um, even some of the, the popular spots were really quiet. Um, and so since it was only a week long, I traveled pretty lightly and I flew down. Um, so I only brought with me a sketchbook, pencils and, um, and paints and brushes. And, uh, and that was about it and had no idea or plan in mind as to what I was going to come back with but just had kind of this, this concept of, if I was to sit on a site day after day after day, what would I observe from that site? So the color journal is a huge part of the architecture of memory process. Um, what I did very similarly to a, um, in referencing you know, past works is I would go for a hike. Um, and my first hike that I ever did, I just kind of went out on my hike with my phone and that was it. <laughs> and over the course of um, being on the hike, had noticed like, oh, look at this, uh, look at like the colors of the soil were amazing. The shapes of the rocks were amazing. The shapes of the foliage and the fact that there was foliage in the desert, like, you know, what are your preconceived notions of, of what a desert space looks like? And um, being an East Coaster and especially, you know, Pennsylvania and New York, this was a very foreign environment to me. So noticing all these different things for the first time was, uh, was really uh, exciting. So I decided to start collect specimen. And then after collecting the specimen, I would color match those to these colors you see here on the, on the right side. And then I would write um, about that experience of that hike and, what, and um, what happened on that hike. And then also what I was thinking on that hike. So I'm gonna talk about a project which the, the previous color journal is related to called um, July, Color Study of July 19th. Um, and it's of the Rio Grande River that runs through Truth or Consequences. Um, so in my first time doing this, I was a little meek in terms of the, the specimens that I was collecting. I didn't wanna to be too invasive and, um, but I wanted to find diverse enough species that I was able to kind of represent the color and then also the shape of the of the space um, well. So you see there on the right, or sorry, the left, the um, objects that I collected. And then on the right there is a one viewpoint of the river that I would visit each day. And the thing that really struck me about the um, uh, being in New Mexico was the intensity of the light. It created all these really hard lines and kind of um, more angles than anything else was something that I really noticed. Um, whereas the, and some of the species, the, the specimens were also um, had, were very angular in form and whatnot. So in, in addition to developing a color palette, I was also kind of developing this language of, of form too. Let me show you a quick video. And so then I would take these videos as documentation to remember, you know, different forms and whatnot. But what I was looking at specifically here was the light interaction with the water. 
Um, so you get these really beautiful undulating diamonds there with the light. Hear a little bit of the birds in the background. Um, and so those were really important to me um, in further development of this piece I'm going to show you. So drawing on my architectural background, um, I'd like to plan things ahead of time and map them out um, to make sure that they fit within a space. And I was, a friend had invited me to be in a show in um, Harlem School of Arts up in um, Harlem, New York here. And, uh, and she said, you have this wall, do with it what you will. <laughs> and so I mapped out what would have been in, in using the map of truth or consequences, Quinces. this was the river, the Rio Grande through the town itself. Um, this down here is the hill that I hiked almost every day. And so this is kind of like my viewpoint from the river in that one image. Um, this is where I stayed. This was the water tower that I visited. And then this was kind of like a no man's land that a lot of people told me not to go to just because it was such an intense hike and to be alone, you shouldn't do it. So they, so this kind of marks for me all the the major points that were part of my experience when I was there, um, as well as you know just kind of using this composition of following the river to um, to develop the piece. So this is the overall installation. It's about you know fourteen feet wide and ten feet tall, um, and it had all these individual you know pieces. And so the those undulating light diamonds that I was talking about. What I did was I used cheap metal and I um, cut them into diamonds and then also into triangles and I um, and I hammered them so that they would be kind of like these these you know molded folded pieces to represent the water because of that reflection but then also that one little tiny shape you saw at the micro scale um, so they follow the exact line of the the river um, in this composition and then the foliage colors of that specimen group. Um, these are all those matched colors, just very solidly laid out um, onto in, in acrylic paint onto an acetate of sorts, and then uh, cut into shapes and installed by by uh, carpentry nail. And so this is architecture uh, for New York. And I'm going to run through this one quick because I'm running low on time. Um, so this was a project that I did in a residency at Cha North, which is based in upstate New York in the town of Pine Plains. Uh, I was there for a month, which was fantastic. So I had the opportunity to visit the same sites again and again to um, develop more of a relationship with them over time. Uh, it was a very familiar landscape because, um, you know, it's East Coast and it's the, the areas that I'm really familiar with. So I was able to dive into um, kind of location and uh, form a little more in this one. Uh, I kind of, I stick to color when I don't know what else to do <laughs> kind of thing. Um, but I did the same thing where I had the notebook, you know, the audio recorder, and I didn't have a plan in mind other than the framework of what ha I had built when I was in uh, New Mexico. And so here you'll see, this is one of the uh, color journals and color palettes that I had with the specimen group on the right. And then this is the piece that came out of it. And so what I was doing at this point was developing prototypes that could be used for larger um, installations. Um, you see the, the image there on the right of the meadow is the, the, where those specimens came from. And then, so I also use that as kind of like um, wanting to be surrounded by these colors and these shapes. So in this image of the, installation on your left. This is like a little 10 by 10 frame. Um, and then this little white piece in the center of that frame is like a six foot, or I guess it's like a five foot six person. Think of it that way. So that person would be standing in the installation amidst all these colors. And then same thing with this one. This was a color palette that I uh, had gathered at Lake Taconic. Um, and there on the left, you see the color journal entry for it. And then this is the same idea where you have this larger installation and because it was in the water and I was actually on the water kayaking um, into these kind of lily pad areas, uh, everything was so much more wandering um, and kind of had more of a flow, go with the flow to it type thing. 
So I wanted it to be less contained and more, um, more organic in nature. And the thing I wanna point out about these at this point is even though when I was in New Mexico, I was naming things by dates. When I was in um, New York, I was really, really adamant about naming dates to colors and times so that I could, um, I could know that in this particular moment in time, these colors and these shapes are what existed then and there. And then the big project that I did when I was um, in upstate New York was a installation that was in the sculpture garden that is behind the Cha North residency campus. Um, so this was, what I did was I, um, I collected specimen from around the perimeter of my studio itself. And, um, and then there was this tree that was out, right out front of my studio window um, from where my studio table was. And I had started to develop a plan for this tree because the, um, I guess the month prior before I got there, the whole area had been swept with a tornado. So there were all these trees that had, had come down. Um, and this one in particular was struck by lightning and hit by the tornado and kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, adjacently. And so I wanted to use this tree originally, but then we realized that all this was poison ivy. So I had to change my site. So then walking through the, the back sculpture area along the trail of the sculpture area were all these fallen trees. So I decided that I would sprinkle kind of like these butterflies, um, these cells almost that were kind of, uh, you know, just the piece is called presence. And the reason it's called presence is because it's these things that just kind of appear in places where they should not be. Um, and the sense that something is always there kind of. Uh, so the nice thing about these is that they are constantly fluttering in the, in the wind and they interact with the, the environment. The intention was for them to fade over time. So this is an image of um, your documentation of each of them in August of 2018. And then I went back in November of 2018 and they still look pretty good. <laughs> I had it, wanted them to fade um, and they didn't quite fade. So it just goes to speak to the use of plastics and kind of um, and acrylics and things like that, which now has become a larger part of my practice. And then the last architecture memory project I'm going to talk about very quickly is when I was in Oregon with that group at Playa Art and Science. And so um, this site was Summer Lake, Oregon, which is a remote area in central Oregon. Uh, it was the first time that I was in the high desert in a really remote location. It was also a month long residency, which was great. Uh, so I had time to revisit a lot of the sites and also develop, you know, kind of a, a large array of sites too. Um, and so again, didn't have a plan in mind, but I had the experience of the past two times and I just wanted the space to talk to me. The thing that really struck me about Oregon and specifically the high desert was the color and atmosphere um, at any moment in the day. I mean, this is, these two images were taken maybe like a half hour from each other kind of thing. It was the atmosphere changed so much. So I knew it was something I wanted to, to definitely capture. And then there were, I was there in February of 2020 and the, um, and I thought, oh, you know, it's winter time. I don't know what specimens I'm really gonna find that are gonna be so interesting, but the grasses were amazing. They took on these different forms. Um, you see like the little starlets there on the right side. Um, also just the way that they laid upon each other and kind of interacted with each other was something that I was really um, interested in working with. And so this was the first site that I did a piece for. Um, the playa there is in the distance um, and our studio space is just behind you. Um, and so these pictures are here to show just the different types of grasses and kind of the behaviors amongst them um, to see where I got my, my color palette. Um, here's the, you know, the color journal with all of that stuff. I have actually started um, in, at this point, I started documenting the different species of the plants too. Um, there was a really uh, great guy who was a uh, forest firefighter um, working on the campus and he had helped me to identify a lot of the different species because he had worked in the area for so long. So it's something that's become a very kind of, you know, big part of my practice at this point. And then this was the resulting piece, which again are much more like prototypes and kind of um, models for a larger installation eventually. 
And then the thing I want to note here is I'm now recording the time on so that 11 a.m. So that atmosphere that I was talking about at 11 a.m., that's what these blocks of colors are. It's those were the colors that kind of stood out most prominently at that time. And then another site very quickly, this was um, color study for February 22nd, also at 11 a.m. This was on the opposite side of the road from us, um, looking back away from the playa. And the same time of day, 11 a.m., those colors of that, in, that atmosphere are very different. Um, and then even the grasses on that side of the road were very different. So here's the color palette for those and the specimens there on the right. And this one is, is called Three Dog Trail. And then here's a photograph of the final artworks, again, prototypes and or models for larger installations. Okay, so the present. <laughs> so um, when I was in Oregon, um, the, and since the residency at Playa was so remote, uh, time slowed down quite a bit. Um, and with time slowing down, like the visuals of time were heightened quite a bit. Um, and then also the ecology and the site uh, were, were, um, were something that I was really tuned into when I was out there. I showed you before the pond willow, um, and here it is again. <laughs> so the pond willow was directly outside my window um, and during the residency. And so I couldn't ignore the fact that it was changing. It had this beautiful personality that it was interacting with, you know, the atmosphere of the day to day. Uh, so I decided to take a photograph of it every time I saw it doing something different. And then I began to notice a rhythm as to the time of day that, that this would change in particular. This is just to show you, you know, this is the same nearly the same time on two different days and how different it looks. Also, it's just, you know, beautiful, that image on the right I love. And then the top row of images there, that's over the course of one day from 821 to 527. And then also um, the bottom row is a different day, uh, but we're beginning to see more of the elements interacting with it in that, in that space really nicely. Um, you know, the pond, the rippling of the pond and, uh, and whatnot. So um, since late in time were such a large part of my experience at Playa, I started to document uh, the movement of light in my, on my studio wall um, on a nearly weekly basis. So I'll show you a quick time lapse. So what I'm doing here is I'm using graphite and starting with the top left page, I'm going through and tracing the light on each one of the, the pages from left to right and all the way down to that bottom row. And the goal was to do that until the light had completely passed that whole area. Um, so this just gives, gives you a sense of kind of what that drawing looks like translated into a digital form would be. Um, and you know, this was the one, two, three, four, that was the order in which I was drawing on each of all, all of them. The image there on the right, you can start to see a little bit, some of these notes I'm taking on the page. So for like the first round that I would pass, I would put, you know, round one, um, second round, round two, third round, round three. So I'm doing, you know, 12 rounds of drawing on each on these pages. Um, and then I would also make notations about, you know, like this one says 11 L, and then it has an arrow pointing to the left. So that um, is round 11, L means the light is that way kind of thing. So shadow one way, light the other way. Just almost like, again, blueprints to give me um, a sense of uh, what I'm going to do later with them. And so I developed, I think six of these, five of these, six of these when I was there um, during my time. And uh, the drawing on the left is what that drawing would look like um, translated digitally. Um, and then the image here on the right is a, uh, like a sundial of sorts. So each one of these was supposed to exist and still in the works to exist as a sundial that would, could be installed on a site somewhere. And the thing that I really love about these pieces is that the, um, that it's like February, 2020, Oregon, central Oregon, it can be lifted and moved to you know, July, 2022, Brooklyn Bridge Park, New York, 
And then the interaction of that space and time is something that forever lives on and is exponential. So then that sundial here in Brooklyn, New York can produce new tracings. And then those new tracings can go on to live elsewhere. So this is uh, specifically February 7th in the morning. And then the next one here is February 14th. And you see how different they are based on just, you know, cloud cover and what time I woke up, and, you know, all those, those different things. And so um, when I got back from, uh, from Playa, as we all know, uh, the pandemic happened. And I started talking with these two artists, uh, Rita the Duke, who's based here in New York, and then Leah Wilson, who's based in Eugene, Oregon. And we had met um, through a science and art conference. And we were all trying to decide, you know, is our, is our work somewhere between the science and art conversation? Um, so we've been meeting regularly to determine, you know, what that looks like for each of us in our practices. But what we've defined is that we're listening to the sites the most, um, both of them are working with scientists and experimental forests to kind of make art that's based on their experiences. Um, and then uh, defining a relationship with place that is both short term and also long term. So I started this project in January of 2021 um, in my backyard. Um, I was longing for the residency experience of a relationship with place. So I started collecting specimen and documented their colors and their forms from season to season for the past 12 months. Um, and like I said, it's in my backyard here in Brooklyn, it's Prospect Park um, on a hill that I used to run um, and actually still run uh, known as Lookout Hill. And I've developed relationships with specific trees and species that have spoken to me over the last year. Um, I'm learning more about their time as a poet through the process as opposed to my time. Um, which ingrains a level of respect, knowing and kinship of place. So uh, a lot of these specimens that I've been showing you in the different times of the month, I now have a very <laughs> close relationship with their, their, um, their mother counterparts. Um, so then with this process, it's, or this project, it's in the early stages like you've seen for others. So it only exists in the color journal aspect, but what I've done is I haven't written any sort of memory recalls this time. And I'm going to go back now from month to month. So this January will be a really true memory recall of what happened last January as I'm going through the photos for last January. Um, so I'm kind of testing my memory, which I think is an interesting aspect of itself. And I'm looking forward to seeing what that brings. Um, and then here on the right, you see, well, on the left in this, this slide, you see the dried up version of all these specimens that I've been collecting in my studio. And on the right, you see, um, some of the color palettes that I've been developing off of them over the time. And the intention for this is that it will eventually become a, um, uh, like a colored time portrait of a non-human species. Okay, so <laughs> um, I've thrown a lot at, at you all for, um, in terms of like where my practice has been, where it's come. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of questions because I know it so well and sometimes don't explain it very similarly to the, you know, the synesthesia experience, don't always explain it fully. Um, so feel free to ask any and all questions. Um, and yeah, that's all. Okay, so I see, oh, hey, Fuslat, <laughs> good to see you or hear from you. Um, and Gavin here, when did you first discover, learn you had synesthesia? When I was in uh, college was the first time. Um, so I was, I think a freshman in college and I was sitting at my studio desk with a deskmate at the time. And he mentioned something about the letter B being a certain color. And, um, and so I told him B is not normally that color. And he asked what I was talking about. And so um, that's when I had a, a friend who was also in, studying medical uh, uh, nursing at the time. And so she um, did some research and found out what it was called. And I have a question here from Jacob. What is the most important, what is most important about your art? What is most important? Um, oof, that's a good question. I think the most important part is that um, my art practice has a way to get me to be self-reflective 
on a lot of things, but also to be reflective outside of myself too, which has been um, something that is really, really welcomed, especially in the last two years through the pandemic. Um, it also gets me, gives me quite a bit of ease at times too. And so I think it's important to have a creative practice that feeds you as much as it be, as you feed it kind of thing. Um, and then also just, I'm the type of person where I need to create, it doesn't matter what it is, um, which is why I work in small scale quite a bit and I work large scale. So things, some things are planned, some things are not planned. And I consider it all part of like, the art process and the creative process. So I think that um, it's just important to know what what is feeding you, what isn't. And so if that's self-reflection, if it's reflection outwards, then that's great. Um, that's what it does for me. Um, Lauren, we have a couple of um, hands raised for people to ask questions as well, but I wanted to quickly, while we were on the subject of art, ask you about other artists you think you're in dialogue with, if any, like I, I, I'm assuming there's architecture, but you, and you mentioned John Cage, but I thought of like Yoyo Kusama. And there are a lot of artists right mm, now that mm -hmm. are working with scientists, but Solowit, like some of the minimalists, Agnes Martin. I'm wondering. Yep, you're naming all the people. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and would you yes. say just a little bit about how, like how sure. that um, transpires, that dialogue? Yeah, sure. So uh, Solowit, I actually, in my, um, my graduate degree at Christie's, I did my thesis on him. Um, and so he started to get me thinking about this um, this more conceptual framework, which I really love, and kind of the, the participation factor, which I love too. Um, and I was looking, I was specifically looking at his works, which are so planned and methodical and mathematical in ways. I was looking at how they weren't. Um, so that he was creating these spaces, but like what's within that void? Or he's, um, he's giving you space to do this, and then you know all these other questions happen um or the pieces where it's like a, a line draw a line wall drawing um he's giving you the instruction but then what is what are the interactions that happen beyond that instruction so i was really interested in kind of him giving you the framework for a dialogue and then people lifting it off which i think is really a, an important part of of the art conversation and the art practice um and so I see my work a lot as the same, where I'm giving you the, um, like for instance, the New Mexico piece, that installation piece, when that was on view, I had spoken to a woman who had just gotten back from being in South America where she was originally from. And she was like, did you produce this after being in this you know, particular town in South America? And I was like, oh no, I was in New Mexico. And she had such a visceral reaction to it being very, the colors and the shapes being so close to things she experienced back home that she said it felt like taking her home, um, which was one of the most wonderful reviews you can receive as someone who, you know, displays something. Um, and so I think that uh, it's, you know, it's providing the piece for people to have the dialogue or to have the experience of memory, um, whatever it might mean for them. Great. But also, um, so you had mentioned, um, so architects, I was actually going to throw these in, but figured it was too much time. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright, organic architecture in general is a huge piece for me. So Frank Lloyd Wright, especially, um, Ife Jones, I actually, he was one, he was the architect who got me started on this architecture of memory path. Um, and, uh, and then also Javier Sinosian, who is a, a Mexican architect who does these really biomorphic kind of organic shapes and really um, interesting architecture. Um, tons of architectural theorists like Italo Cavino, um, blanking on others. But yeah, there's, you know, all sorts of, of people. Kandinsky is someone who I like looking at, um, but I'm not sure if, if I totally agree with him, <laughs> and especially a lot of his theory and stuff, um, just from very specifically from the synesthetic pr perspective. Um, and uh, Eva Hesse, she's a big one for me. Interesting. All right, we have, um, I think uh, we have uh, Zoe and then Avi are two people with their hands up currently. So maybe we'll start with them. We've got more people coming. So great. I guess Avi, do you want to go? 
Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, just wanted to say thanks for coming and speaking to us. Um, and I had a couple of questions. Uh, one is um, regarding your piece with the pond willow. The first mm -hmm. thing that I saw um, with your photographs was that it looked to me like a cerebral map of a brain, mm -hmm. like all the little branches kind of being like synapses and neurons. And I was wondering if, if you kind of I've ever thought of that connection yourself. Um, oh, totally. It's uncanny. <laughs> it's a, it was like almost too good to be true the first time I saw it. Um, and that, that mirror effect is what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, especially. Yeah. And I think, I mean, it was, it was always, always such a beautiful scene to begin with, but I had been photographing it from a different point of view um, to capture more of the atmosphere and the light, like you saw in those two photos I sh showed everyone of the, uh, the warmer, um, color and then the cooler color. And, um, and then when, I, once I saw that cerebral effect you're talking about, as soon as I saw that the first time I was like, yep, this one, I have to continue to, to follow every day. And then my second question is, um, so I'm in the class temporality word and image that's mm -hmm. uh, visiting. And so, we're kind of like looking at um, lots of different artists and writers and how they kind of view this theme of temporality, um, focusing on like the past, present or future. And so like I see all of those things in your artwork, like focusing on the past, the present and the future. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering if you had a particular affinity towards like either the past, the present or the future, if they're all um, really important or like what kind of stands out to you first or what is the most like um engaging for you yeah it's a great question um it's something i've been thinking about a lot lately actually and um and i'm surpri actually surprised i didn't bring it up in my presentation come to think about it um so i used to focus a lot on the past um and so a lot of the the architecture of memory started off as like a memory recall um and trying to sort through whatever was happening then i then i um like what happened before and not necessarily in the now um, and then I realized over time, I, so I have a, I've, I've had over the years, a very difficult time with change. Um, and so, and it, we won't get into the specifics of it, but basically what, through these projects, um, what I've learned is they've helped me to become more comfortable with change. Um, and that could be a change from, you know, a change of plans, for instance, someone cancels on you or um, you know, like having to move out of your apartment into a new apartment. So different scales of change, um, what it means for you personally. And so uh, this, has, this project has helped me and uh, to be very, very much more comfortable with that, um, that element and also to see the beauty and change. Um, so especially this, this Prospect Park project, watching like the same tree change over time and knowing that it's going to come full, full circle and come back is something that's been really beautiful. So, um, and metaphorical in different ways and kind of kind of relates back to you as a, as a person and, and, you know, to the outer world in different ways. Um, so just knowing that has been, has been really helpful to bring me into the present. So I think right now I'm very much in the present when I'm looking at a lot of this and I typically, I would go back and revisit past projects. And I haven't done that because I've been so focused on um, this whole being in the present for documenting these individual objects. Now I have to kind of shift back to, <laughs> you know, that past conversation to see what's happened over the last year and sifting through all the information. But um, that's a great question. I really, I really love that you, you picked up on that. There are a couple of questions I'm going to put together in the Q&A here. One was about your the process-based experimental aspect of your work. And then Vuslot, I don't know if you want to ask it, but um, or I can read it. Um, but Vuslot is yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I can I can answer the um but the they're related. Do you see how they're related? Because then Vuslot's saying what it, when it comes together, it becomes so meticulous mm -hmm. and labor intensive. So where is that relationship of the experiment with that? Sure, process? so she's, sorry, I have to read this. On the note of process and conceptualism, I'd love to hear more about the creative tension between how technical and minimalistic the final work looks, yeah. And the meticulous and labor intensive process of its making. <sighs> yeah, I mean, the whole thing is, um, 
from start to finish, it's pretty meticulous. I mean, they're especially going through this Prospect Park project where I um, I started, you know, I was like really gung ho. I'm gonna go out once a month, pick specimens, come back, color match them, document all of that, move on. Right? Um, it sounded really easy, and it's not at all. <laughs> it's um, and so a lot of um, and actually, was thought you and I had talked about this before in the show that you and Ilkner put together um, this this idea of endurance um, and something that's been really in really needed this past year um, or the past two years, especially is that endurance factor, because for me, it's a combination of mind and body and that's where they both meet. And so very often, and you can see in my practice, you know, with the mind space project, I'm so in my head that I'm on one side and this architecture of memory, you're out in the field, just kind of doing things with your body that they can be very different. Whereas the, in, the meticulousness that comes in in the actual execution and fabrication of it is almost like a connection of those two. It becomes like a reflection moment on what has happened um, through the process, but it also is so much tied to, um, I think a lot of it has to do with the architectural training that I received and being such a technical um, uh, institution, but um, I, th I like to see it as like a combination of the both of those through an endurance process. I don't know if that answers the question. Oh, and there's a question from Nancy. Nancy, you're the same way. Hi, Nancy. Um, your work is process-based experimental. Please talk about why that is. And um, I mean, I, I think it comes down to the same thing. It has to be process-based in order for the site to tell you what it wants to tell you. So um, I like to go into most times, especially in my arts administrative life, I'm going into something where I'm making a plan and the plan is set. Um, in my art practice, I like to do the opposite where I want to leave chance open for things to manifest themselves. So that's why when, um, when in color translations, it was important to shift to a different material or to shift to a different uh, text because it was gonna give me more, you know, problem solving ability or whatever it is. Um, the process is really important because I think that an artwork and the, and the endurance of doing an artwork is what, I'm trying to think of the best way to say this, is what makes the final product more authentic if that makes sense. Um, we have a raised hand. I don't know the name. It's Schwart L. Do you want to ask your question? Yes, hello. Uh, uh, it's Leonard, uh, Leonard Schwartz. And um, oh, hi, Leonard. Uh, hi, hi, Shaw. How are you doing? Uh, thanks for organizing this. And thank you. I'll second Avi and thanking uh, you, Lauren, for coming to speak to us. Uh, I have a question about the term phenomenology. You used it at the beginning. It's, an, it's a very rich philosophical tradition, uh, mm -hmm. and it might mean something different for Husserl or Merleau-Ponty or different. I was curious if you could say a little bit about how what the term means for you or how phenomenology as a philosophical practice and tradition uh, informs, informs your work more specifically. Yes, thank you so much for asking that question. Um, I, if, I've I've been back and forth on using the word phenomenology because it's so loaded, especially in the philosophical histories as to how we, we speak about art in particular, and then also just space and whatnot. Um, I think that, um, uh, so I'm coming at the perspective of phenomenology from architectural theorists like uh, Ioanni Palasma, who is a Finnish art, uh, architect, and then also Italo Covino, um, where phenomenology is the experience of the, um, the experience of a space that is based on time and space. If that makes sense. So um, what I'm what I'm interested in, and I don't know, I I know I'm going to trip over myself with this, <laughs> this particular uh, thing because it is so so um, heavily weighted. Um, but phenomenology is is a subjective experience. It's something that I will only experience how to, and I will only experience how um, I'm sitting here on this couch and what this room, the square walls look like to me. Someone else being in this space at a different point in time is going to experience it differently, whether it's them making it their own or um, 
you know, the conditions, like the physical materiality of the room changes. There are all these different factors that, uh, that filter into what our experience in the world comes down to. And so that's why I use the word phenomenology. Um, I hope that answered your question. Yes. No. yes, thank you, thank you. Okay. Um, is, is there a Carla there or? You've had, I, I can't quite tell if there's somebody that just wanted to ask and hasn't been able. Um, we also have Hassoon here that would like to ask a question. Hello, can I ask you a question? Yes, of course. Okay. Uh, I am a psychologist and actually I taught at Evergreen for a long time. I'm mm -hmm. just blown away by your presentation. How, what kinds of beliefs and values uh, helps you to sustain the way you are without being culturally contaminated? You know, we are extrinsic oriented culture here. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You were talking about reflection. We don't really emphasize that much. So I'm so mm -hmm. curious about whether you can share some of your values and beliefs that helped you to be you. Sure, of course. Um, so uh, I grew up Catholic. Um, I think sometimes the, the religion conversation helps in this. I grew up Catholic, but I am not a practicing Catholic any longer. Um, I had, as a, as a child, I found that the, the religion was really helpful in terms of the framework and the understanding of different, um, uh, different perspectives in, in the sense of what Catholicism and, and basics of Christianity was. But for some reason, it didn't fulfill me as a person in the ways that I wanted it to. And it wasn't, um, and I think I felt this in different ways over the years since from early childhood through today. But when in 2017, when I was in New Mexico and I was standing on the top of the, um, the that hill trail that I was telling you about overlooking the Rio Grande, I had a moment where I thought, this is my religion. And it was, um, you know, being in the middle of nature, observing nature, being one with nature, um, considering, did I say this, considering myself nature um, and knowing how much we are connected to the world around us and how much our actions make an, a big impact on the world um, was some, is something that I often think about. Uh, I don't know where that was ingrained in me, but even from, you know, I can remember sitting at the dinner table as a child and being like, isn't it odd that we live with little beasts? Um, and just being very aware of how closely we were linked to something that, um, that our society doesn't see us as so much linked to. And actually, so um, Rita and Leah, who I mentioned in my presentation, we have this conversation quite a bit about where we, we find ourselves fitting within that framework and where this reflection comes from. And I think it's really a deep um, relationship with, with uh, ecology and understanding that there's a connection there. Um, there's, I'm definitely the type of person where if I get, like I'm, I'm, a, home, I'm a homebody, but I also feel most comfortable when I'm, when I'm outdoors in, um, in a park, especially when I can get away to a place like Oregon in, in the high desert. Um, yeah, there's just something about, about being in nature that's really important to me. And so I think that that's where it comes from. Thank you. So we have a couple more questions here, some clarifying questions. Um, can you name the Finnish architects you, you mentioned with the phenomenology question? Sure, it's uh, Yuani Plasma. And his first name is spelled J-U-H-A-N-I. And last name is P-A-L-L-A-S-M-A-A. -A -A. Great. And then there are, it seems like there are some questions here that are about time endurance process. Um, and then up above, there's a question about daylight saving time, changing the mm -hmm. color. And then um, I, you can see all these as well. Yeah, um, do you want me to just run through the Q&A? And, and yeah, there are just quite there? a few, sure. You yeah, do sure. It, you do it, yeah. So there's uh, one from Amy, it says, how did you develop such a rigorous self-directed art process? I think we, I think we answered that one. Um, a lot of it was developed from architecture, uh, 
in architecture school, they really whip you into shape <laughs> in terms of uh, deliverables and um, and kind of the meticulousness of uh, like I, I was trained as a, a drafter, um, you know, pencil and uh, drafting paper, not on the computer. So I have and then I was also trained on the computer, too. So I have the uh, kind of the sensibility to do both of those things. So I think there's rigorousness in that. But then also um, this connection of the mind body in the studio. I'm a really meticulous person. Um, there's a question from Megan. Do you ever have things that lack color instead of present instead of present as a color? Um, Megan, are you referring to the uh, the experience of synesthesia? Or are you talking about the artwork itself? I can answer both. <laughs> So um, the experience of synesthesia, the only thing that lacks color is my mind space. Um, and I think that's because the color field is so vibrant that um, I need kind of like a neutral background for it is what I've determined over time. In my artwork, I actually only ever used to work black and white when I first started. Um, and I did stipplings all the time and I really loved the texture of the stipplings. And then I got to a point where the texture wasn't doing it for me in terms of the space time quality. So I started to move into color. Um, Zachary, you have, oops. Uh, thank you for this presentation. You're welcome, Zachary. Um, work is beautiful, inspiring, thank you. It was incredible to be able to see behind the curtain of your creative processes. Great, cool, glad to hear that. Couldn't help but notice a type of dialogue between art and science in your work, maybe even between the ideas of subjective and objective experience as a whole. Yes, totally. Um, I get the sense that your work celebrates blending both, that it's correct. My way off track in approaching viewing your art with this perspective in mind. Nope, you're totally right. Um, there was a point in time and actually why Rita, Lee and I, and I got together to start this whole conversation around art and science was because each of us was working with science in some capacity, but we didn't believe that we were really like artists who were interested in science. There was this, what we're calling our podcast, the third thing. Um, and so we, we have started to talk around these different subjects of like where we exist within these fields and whether we're ecological artists, which we don't really think we are. We're kind of like whatever that third thing of an artist is. Um, so yes, you are correct. I'm, I'm doing all those things. I'm glad you caught on. Uh, Gavin, we have, um, how has your art process changed throughout the pandemic and quarantine? Yes, that's a great question. Um, so I started working really small and I also, for the, um, the pieces that I'm doing at home and I also have been working more digitally too. So that Mindspace project was actually started during the pandemic. Um, so that's when I shifted to uh, digital and was really working in that capacity. It was feeding me really um, well creatively at the time and it's kind of petering out now a little bit, which is why I've switched to doing those small um, painting and sketch pieces because um, I do have a studio, but um, I haven't been there in a little bit just because of Omicron and stuff. So I do have like a set of work I can do here at home that's on the much smaller scale. And then anything that gets larger and kind of more involved, I do in my studio. Um, Lowell, is there any color relationship to time for you? Does it change? What have you gleaned from your pieces if this is the case? I do not have a color relationship to time. Um, when I first read it, it was kind of like, maybe I do, but no, I don't think I do. Um, that would be pretty fascinating though. I, mean, I think it's just, for me, time is um, is a scale and, and it's spatial. Um, Mercury, uh, I don't have synesthesia, but I'm autistic. Yes, we can have that conversation too. And I'm really interested in the experiences you're speaking of. What books and artists do you recommend I use to continue to educate myself. I know we talked a bit about that, but I think you having a written list would be really cool. Yes, I'm totally happy to send along a written list after the fact. Um, I, that, that moment I was talking about change that has a little bit to do with, um, with uh, an undiagnosed, uh, you know, possibly on the lower end of the spectrum of that too. Um, and so, it's something that I have also been really interested in. I've read a lot of Temple Grandin. Um, Oliver Sacks does a lot of great uh, research with and writing around 
subjects over the year, not directly, or over the year, over the years, <laughs> not directly related to autism, um, but other conditions that um, kind of make that feel relatable. Uh, I would start there with those two. And then from there, you can totally branch out into different areas. Uh, Colby talked a bit about daylight savings changing how you color translated. In general, how much does time affect your synesthesia? Would a color translation be drastically different if done a year's part? Good question. And as a follow up, when changes happen, is it more different, more of different colors standing out or are the colors entirely different? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, when, before I identified that I had a black mind, a black backdrop or mount mind space, um, I thought I only saw vowels because they were the most vibrant in color. And then there are a lot, of, and then there were certain consonants that were also vibrant enough in color to see, but there was like a, a range of certain consonants that I didn't think I had any color associations with. And then I realized that they were very close to that black color background, black color backdrop, which is why this mind space project has been really interesting to kind of um, to work with and see how closely some of those colors come to that, that black backdrop. So um, in terms of me reflecting and realizing and kind of like unearthing stones of my own condition, that is something that continues with time but the colors for graphing color synesthesia always change, stay the same. So once I've identified what the color is, it never changes. Um, so little, in terms of synesthesia and its reproductions. Hmm, don't know what that's in reference to, so we can come back to that. Uh, Krista, you created- yeah, this, we, this would be probably the last question, but this is a great one, I think, to end on. Okay, great. Uh, you created a piece in Pine Plains 2018 that has shadow figures. I assume these are meant to represent human interaction in public space. Yes, that's correct. Would you be willing to talk more about that piece and the intention behind it? Yeah, I think you're referring to, um, there was on my, my introductory image for Pine Plains, there was an image in the bottom right corner that was like a model and it had little uh, shadow figures in it. Um, and yes, because of my architecture background, I'm, I often work in like model form. And so the two pieces I showed you afterwards that were in those frames that had the little white um, kind of uh, piece that was standing up there, that was intended to be a person. So each one of those projects I hope will be, um, they're small scale now, but I hope that they're kind of like a blueprint or a prototype for a larger scale installation that's actually experiential. And the same thing with those light pieces at the end that I referred to as sundials, those, those would also be experiential as well. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, oh this has been really fun. Yeah, <laughs> well, um, yeah, so we'll have you back sometime, but thanks so much, Lauren. And I'll applaud for the, what would be <laughs> uh, in person. Great, thank you. Thanks for everyone who came out today. It's been really nice sharing the, my practice with everyone. Okay. Talk to you soon, bye. Bye.